maker, Hashem. Um, oh, it's told me to introduce myself. My name is Carla Jus, and I'm a photographer at the Miami Herald. And I'm um, and also a founder of Irish Photo Collective. Um, this is not about me. Um, this is about us through the voices and the vision of Hashem. So my first question to you, I, and I've noticed this, uh, how many times have I seen this film? I'm sorry if I'm standing up, because I'm, I'm, I usually lecture a lot, so I, so I stand up, I'll sit down. My first question to you is, you told the story in three rails. On this, on the history of Haiti, on your intimate story itself, your personal story, and also through the voice of the diaspora. Um, and you weave these three elements in and out, in and out, in and, in and out, in and out. And I'm really concerned. Did this story start out that personal for you? Yeah, I mean, I definitely had questions about identity. You know, as a kid, as I mentioned in the film, I was the first generation born outside of Haiti. Um, and growing up in New York City in the 80s, it was really difficult because a lot of kids would either say that I didn't look like a Haitian, and that used to hurt a lot. And these were kids like, these weren't just, they were kids just like me. They were first generation of something. Either Puerto Rican, Dominican, even at continental Africans. But somehow, uh, Haitians always got like teased and talked to the worst, and, and it just, it really, it really bothered me a lot as a kid. Um, and then when I would go home, you know, in our little two-bedroom cooped-up apartment, my mom would say, well, c'est bourgeois, even. you're bourgeois. And I was like, well, we're drinking Kool-Aid and eating crackers. How's that? <laughs> you know, and uh, so she would show me these amazing, you know, my grandmother kept great documentation of her life with her, with my grandfather in the, mid 1950s and just looking at the pictures they told every picture told a story so there was all these complexities as a kid um, and then of course watching the news all you would see was either poverty or political madness uh, so yeah I had a lot of questions and so when I first started the film the questions were a, a lot about identity and race and class but going into Haiti and then meeting people like you and Mecca um, and some of the other people in the film, Wyclef, of course, you know, I, I didn't know Wyclef personally, um, but I'm sure a lot of people can attest in our generation that Wyclef kind of did something to us and kind of gave us like that sense of pride, you know, because we didn't have it, because some, some, some nations already had the pride, they just had to fight through it. Well, especially at the Grammys. Yeah, especially at the Grammys, right. right. So, so, yeah, so the, the story definitely shifted, uh, shifted throughout the time of the shooting. All right, okay, so you decide you're gonna do this documentary, and you're gonna kind of open up the, your personal treasure box of stories from various people in your family, right? How long did that take? from beginning to end. And, and can you take us through the process once the film was made? Um, how did the public get to see it? Well, um, at the time I was living in Atlanta and I decided to uh, continue my education and I enrolled in the graduate program at the University of Miami. And then I met you. <laughs> I met you and I came here to Miami just a whole different world. I mean, of course, you know, I started off with my own family. My mom, my dad, my aunt, my uncles. Um, and I've, you know, been talking to them for a while about the, the, the film and interviewing them, pre-interviewing them. But then when I met you, I kind of discovered, a, 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 first of all, Miami, right? right, um, right. I discovered your dad. His dad is actually... Uh, Peter Juice, who was the one who coined the phrase Little Haiti. Um, so he's a legend, you know, his dad is a legend, God bless his soul. Um, and it kind of opened doors for me. So I started in 2010 and we finished, uh, we finished the edit 2014. How many cities has this film been in? Uh, 
some show. We've been we've been going to 26 cities wow. around the world. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah, that's you what, where are you living in Harlem, right? Yeah. Where, 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 where in New York would we be living? You're born in Harlem? Yeah, New York. Harlem. That's a lot of places to go for a Harlem girl. Yeah, that is. That is. That is. Um, so, so 26 cities. One of the things I noticed about this film is when I was, as I was watching it, I was saying, how did, how did she tell, how did she tell my story? I mean, my, our lives seemingly parallel. I remember going to the boxes of, of my parents' old pictures and them being very uh, nostalgic about the past. And that's what the past does. But let's speak now to the present. Okay, this, this, we're in 2016 and we just had a major election. And uh, let me ask you. It didn't happen. Well, well, we didn't have it. We don't have a president. We don't have a president. Yeah. Well, a de, a de facto election. Um, do you think, would you have envisioned that Haiti would be in the situation it is now when you started this film? Knowing what you know. Um, I knew that Cuisinot and Michel Martelly definitely had a lot on his hands. I mean, we just, the, this earthquake was the worst disaster on human record, okay? It, we, and, and there's been earthquakes all around the world, but this earthquake was the worst on record. Then, of course, you have the history with all the political madness. And then you have a person who is not, who, who was a singer. <laughs> and not only was he a singer, he was like a bad boy guy, you know? And he now becomes probably had a lot on his hands. Um, did I foresee all this was going to happen? You know, politically, I, I, it's just like here in the States. I, I, you know, when you get in politics, it's kind of like you're a hamster running around in a maze, and you're like, oh my God. But then when you go back to the crux of it, and you go back to the roots, and you go back to the people, and you go back to people like yourself, and, pe and, and Mecca, and people who are really out there um, trying to do what they love to do, whatever it is, to change the identity of Haiti, to me, that was more my story. That was more, okay, this is what it is. In terms of the politics, it's just way too complicated for me to even understand. Um, but at the same time, there were some simple and ba basic things. Like when I went to Haiti, um, you know, Jean Marcin, I gotta give it up for him. Yeah, give it up to Jean. You know, I was telling Jean, I said, please, whatever you do, Let's just not show the poverty side. We have to show this beautiful side of Haiti, the Haiti that we know, the Citadel, the beaches, the mountains, and everything. But in order to get to those places, you had to pass like immense poverty. And I couldn't understand it because you would see like Ferraris and like all these European cars driving fast through those. And those were questions that I had. I, I couldn't, I couldn't deny, I could not deny that. And then of course meeting Shala, you know, from a different class. And my, my aunt was actually the one who was like, you can't leave Haiti without interviewing Shala. And then we just became so, so close. And speaking of uh, the, the politics in Haiti, you know, every time Shala calls me, because we, we're still obviously in touch, when Shala's doing really bad, it's almost like I get a sense of what's going on in Haiti. But, we, but the other day, funny enough, and this is why I don't understand too much about the pops, we don't have a president in Haiti, but he's like, hey, what's that? How you doing? I said, how you doing? He's like, I'm foam. I'm good, I'm good. You know, I'm, I'm holding on, I'm holding on. I'm waiting, you don't know, have my dreams to go to Chicago, but you know, I'm doing okay, you know? And to me, I'm like, ooh, you know, because it, yeah, it's, it's, it's rough. Right. It's rough for somebody like that in Haiti, but not rough for obviously, you know, my family members and stuff like that. So some of the politics I just really don't understand. Okay, uh, one thing I also noticed is that, well, I know several things, but specifically the way it was visually told. Um, I love that the fact that I was, it looked like I was watching somebody's home movie that was really, really good. <laughs> that was really, really good. And it really allowed me to focus on not only what I was, what I was, what I was being told, or the, the development of the story, but the 
development of the story visually. And is, was that intentional, or was that just by, it just how it happened? Well, I definitely had help. You know, my editor, Pascal Marcelin, mm -hmm. and I had like some, you know, people who would watch our dailies, like the stuff that we shot, some interviews. And, you know, they would tell me, listen, you know, you got to implement your story. you got to see more of you. And that was so difficult mm -hmm. as a filmmaker to write about myself, edit myself, and see myself on camera, hear my voice. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> but, um, Talk about you. I didn't want to see myself all day either. Okay, yes. Yeah. I mean, it's like kind of weird, right? But, That's weird. But I realized that they were right. I had, like, it had to come... They had to come from me, and that's why the the story also was heavily narrated. Because mm -hmm. in the end, in the editing room, I needed to narrate everything. Okay, this is my big question. You ready? Okay. Y'all ready? <laughs> is the bell is La Belle V an illusion? Is La Belle V an illusion? You know, La Belle V to me is this deep connection that the diaspora has with Haiti. When you, when I asked you in the film, uh, and this was during the earthquake, because Carl was actually one of the, one of the first journalists on the ground um, to go, and being that he's, so he had two roles, the role of Miami Herald and then the role of your Haitian, by, you know, you were born in Haiti, yeah. raised here, but you know, you're your umbilical cord is there, That's high. right? So the and and you said it was this instinctual feeling, like watching your child drowning, and there was no question whether you were going to go or not. It was like boom. And I think as tragic as the, as the earthquake was, I think so many people in the diaspora had that same feeling. You know, people were watching us on our story on social media. And people who have never been to Haiti, I have like a really good friend who was also born in Haiti but left at the age of one to never return because something tragic happened to her family uh, when she left. And she said, you know, please, can you take me to Haiti? I really want to go. And we actually went, uh, her, her son, and, and, and my kids, we went. And it was, uh, just, it was just this, this connection. As soon as you land on the ground, it's like, Wow, it's something that, it's like Haiti speaks to you as soon as you land. And I think that's that spiritual uh, vibration that you can only experience. And um, just to kind of go off the subject a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you can, the, you're the director. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing about this story is mm -hmm. that, okay, you know, I, these are questions I have. And this was a fascinating conversation. The, the idea of race and class in a country that was the first black republic in the world to say no to slavery, right? right. But yet you have all these issues of class. Um, as we've been showing the film all around, you know, all around the world, as many places as we can get to, I hear people say the same thing. Well, this is my story, and they may come from Jamaica. I had one, you know. Uh, um, a Jewish friend, but by way of Russia, say, this is my story. And then I had students from Mexico, and they're like, they call me Pocho or something. I don't know what the word, if any uh, Mexicans are. Huh? Cholo. Pocho or Cholo. some. Ch Cholo. Cholo. Okay. The, the, equivalent, the equivalent of you're an outsider. Right. Okay? You're not one of us. And then the most chilling factor is because I live here in Miami, is when I hear Cuban Americans say to me, wow, like my parents will never allow me, they won't go come with me to Cuba. I want to go to Cuba, but because of all of, you know, what's going on there, and they, they won't allow me to go, but after seeing this film, I want to go. That's great. I want to reconnect. That's great. And that to me is like, wow, this is, you know, it goes kind of beyond just the Haiti narrative. So that's the reaction of people who don't know you. Well, I was, that was the reaction of people who don't know you but understand the film and have watched the film. What was the reaction of your family members, specifically those who are living, the family members who are in the States, 
independent resistance and hate. Were they similar? Were they different? Can you just expand that on that a little bit? We don't have too much time, but expand it a little bit. Okay, all right. Uh, well, quickly, you know, the family here in, in the States, they love it, especially the ones that are in it. My dad, he was trying to get here. He's like, okay, he's like, he feels like he's a superstar. <laughs> Unfortunately, my mom only got to see bits and pieces of it, but she's always been a supporter, my aunt. Everybody who's in the film um, liked it. I had a few family members who didn't want any part of it. Um, what, what, what? They're just because they're very private and they didn't really want to be a part of it. But um, uh, one thing that I'm... Work, we're working diligently on is to go to Haiti with it. We have not shown it, anyone in Haiti, so we're like, we, we're hoping to get there. Oh, are you going Blu-ray with this? Is, it gonna, is, it, is there possibly a, a uh, distribution? distribution well, that, that's another thing. It's like we're working really hard. It's a very competitive market, so I mean, we, you know, we have to look close. But thanks to the Knight Foundation, you know, they've helped us to travel to these cities and create a story. Is there a part two of La Bella V? Is there a second part? Or is there a sequel? No. <laughs> no. So no. that book is, is closed, no. right? No, so. on to the next story. And, okay. and, and can you kind of give us a, a kind of a glimpse in your crystal ball what this next story might be? Not that we want the whole Yeah, I ha I, I'm, I'm working on a narrative right now. Um, it's, a, it's a Haitian love story. Mm -hmm. And uh, working on a web series about Miami <laughs> and, a, and a short. So I got a lot of things going on. And I see Maj, I hope you guys can see Maj. That's like my new venture to help support people who've been doing excellent work about, about Haiti and also trying to change the identity of Haitian films, you know, um, and really trying to uh, bring up the quality of, of that through the initiative of IZ. Well, I think you're, you're, you're ahead of something amazing. Um, um, it's, it's great to see, you know, Haitians, you know, telling their own stories in their own, in their own first voices. Um, and we're indebted to you. And I'm, I'm sure you, there was a lot of sacrifices that had to be made to get this film done. Um, and um, I know our, both our mothers, Looking down upon us and saying, "La bella vista." Keep lives. going. Keep going. Keep going. But we're gonna open up. We only have maybe another 15, 10 to fifteen minutes, and we even want to open up the questions to the audience. So if you have any questions, raise your hands, and um, you can address it to um, Rachel, the lovely Rachel. I think the one thing that is that is 
great about about Haiti as, as much as you know some of that is true that the diaspora you know the connection between the diaspora and Haiti we love each other you know sometimes you know for some people or maybe in our parents generation it could be kind of an abusive relationship you know that they can't leave each other but right. they can't you know but you know I I. I I, I think it's I think it's great. I think it's I just I just hope that politically also that there could be some more structured um, sort of exchange. Well, I think the point the gentleman made that he didn't introduce himself, and I cannot really see his face, but he made a really important point is that there is this disconnect. There is the story um, when I as a child I used to refer to fable because I could never really other than looking at the pictures there's nothing. Never, it was never a way for me to fact check this, unless I would went I went to some other relative and they'll tell me the same story as it's possibly true. But um, there is this revealing, this kind of onion revealing process in your film, where you start with this beautiful, beautiful story, and and, and you're confronted with, with reality. And I just want to ask a really quick question to you: Is were you, how comfortable? Were you in telling that story that probably went counterculture to what you were hearing? I think it was it was simple when I just you, when I put it to me and not generalized it. So when I was able to say, you know, this is my story, this is my opinion. No one can take that from me. No one can say, you know, that's so you not took ownership of it. Yeah, I took ownership of it. Any more questions? My name is Michael Russell. I'm an African American. I'm a television producer, and I'm also a marketer, a corporate marketer. And I went to Haiti for the first time in 2005. And the question I have to do with here is changing a negative narrative. Because we are told that it's unsafe, it's dangerous, that it's very poor. Uh, Americans are told, don't go there. All right. So when I got there, the thing that I noticed is there's no difference between Haiti and Jamaica and the Bahamas and the Virgin Islands. So that narrative, that narrative that we, we've been taught is wrong. So my question to both of you is, how do we change the narrative into a positive narrative that will get people going to Haiti and wanting to embrace Haiti? Well, if Haiti's good for the Clintons, it's definitely good for me. <laughs> uh, so let's just start there. Uh, I, I'll let, I'll let the show. No, no, you go ahead. It's just, well, just a story. I was actually going to piggyback off of that because you're, you're a journalist, and okay, I'm going to... Go ahead, go out there. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'll, I'll defend, I'll, I can defend myself, don't worry about it, go ahead. But, you know, I, I just, it bothers me that every publication always sticks to politics, right? Like, they don't show other stories going on in Haiti, even if it's a farmer that is... But we have. We have. And I've done them. No, no, we have. We have done a lot of them. Because my policy is, for every coup d'etat cover, I come back with two positive stories. But we, you do it in your personal art. I do, but it, 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 it works yeah. into the Herald. Yeah. It works into the Herald. I mean, yeah, because if you, if you scroll down the Herald for the past year, it's all politics. It's all politics. And there's not, there's not enough exposure on just different stories. But another another thing, you know, I think that people need to do is just step out, you know, step out the box. Yeah. I have a friend who has a friend in New York who developed this travel group called My Haiti Travels. Mm -hmm. There's someone else here that has Haiti Got It. There's like travel groups now that go to Haiti, discover them and go. Just go and create your own story. And Pure Forest leaves every December. Yeah. Pure Forest. Yeah. Little Haiti. They, yeah, yeah. Little Haiti. They take at least, what, 20 professionals. Um, most of them happen to be of, of Haitian descent, but it's, it's a cross-section sometimes. And, you know, it's, it's easy to go by what's, what you heard, but it's so much harder to experience it yourself. Yes, it costs money. Yes, it costs you time, but you know what? You're better for it afterwards. Okay, you're a better person because after it. I mean, 
People forget, I mean, I, I get it all the time. You know, you always cover bad news in Haiti. Well, you know, it's, it's cheaper also to cover bad news. Not that covering Haiti is cheap, but the time commitment, because things happen, and you're in a cycle, and within, you know, 24 hours, people forgot about it. But if you're doing a long-term story, for instance, on on the, the destruction of the, of, of the rice industry in Haiti, and or if you're doing a story about orphanages in Haiti that, that, are, that have a positive spin, that takes a lot of time. You have to sit. You have to let it simmer. You have to let it. You have to let, let it marinate. But I respect the fact that in your art you show a I really do. great. Not only a great side of Haiti, but I love the connection with Cuba as well. Right. So. Well, you know, it's a beautiful Carl, struggle. It's a beautiful struggle. A Any more questions? Can I ask you? Well, I'll get you. I'm not. I'm not coordinating it. So. Hi, my name is Tatiana Moise. Um, I'm a student. I'm 60 years old, and my dad, Jimmy Moise, has been trying to get me to come see this movie forever, and I finally came and saw it. And congratulations. I Thank you, Dad. It. No problem. But my question is, <laughs> yes, thank you, Dad. But my question is, as somebody that was born in the States, raised in the States, how did your kids feel when they went to Haiti for the first time with you? Okay, uh, that's a great question. And before you, and, and one more question uh, to say, uh, one more statement to say, uh, the gentleman who talked about, you know, Jimmy Moise, he does amazing things in Haiti. He brings fashion shows that don't get covered. He brings like Haiti fitness, like trips, like stuff like that. Like it's amazing that like, it's not covered. You know, but he's always doing like really unique things. And anyway, okay, so um, okay, so my kids, they went to Jamaica, right? And and they had a good time. But when they went to Haiti, they loved it. Now my younger one, my 14 year old, she has to eat picklies on everything. Picklies is our, 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 our like hot sauce. It's like a cabbage, a pickle thing. And she puts it on pizza. She puts it on everything. And the really um, interesting thing is that when we went to Haiti, it was during Christmas holiday, and um, we had dinner with my aunt, and Shawa and his boys were the ones kind of chauffeuring us around because we didn't have a car, so... And they waited outside for us. And my older daughter, 18, she's 18, was like, it's Christmas. Why aren't they inside the house? And I'm like, shh, shh. And that was the whole dynamic about having certain people in, you know, the whole class thing that I had to explain. But my daughter was not having it. And it was pissing me off because she was like borderline being rude. And I'm like, stop. So she snuck plates, like while my aunt turned her back, she snuck, she packed plates, and she snuck outside and she gave it to them. And then we went, so we left, you know, hey, that was day one, or whatever. And then we went on the beautiful side, went to Jacques Mel, and we went to like some nice fancy hotels, and she loved that too, you know? Um, and then there was like a party for kids her age group, she loved it too, but she was like, I miss Shala. You know, and because Shala took us to his new home in Haiti. Um, we were on uh, the tap taps, you know, the, the trucks, the colorful trucks. And she got to see, like, all, like, Haiti. And she loved it. She loved it. My, both my kids, they really loved it. As I said, Haiti speaks to everyone. It doesn't even matter if you're Haitian or not. True. It speaks to you. So you have to go with your dad. Oh, Jimmy. <laughs> Okay, next question. Next question. Can I ask a question? Hey, have a good day. Hey, Michelle, it was a great, great film. Oh, great. Just came, I just came back from Haiti in December with one of the trips to the ultimate Haiti experience. And I was supposed to be there now, but with the election, I chose not to go. You know, maybe seeing a State Department note when I got my passport two days before I flew there because I had lost it. You know, with the election time, but I love the place. You know, <clears throat> just it's a really beautiful place. Shame a lot of people don't go. Thank you. We, we have a question up front. And this um, this gentleman here is one of one of my favorite people. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Go ahead, please. Take my microphone. Yes. Uh, I am a Ray Renard 
Kabatis, the, uh, I work for Channel 10, right. yeah. Channel 7, and uh, my, uh, my father was an historian, an ambassador for him in Africa. Uh, my question is that uh, when you were uh, you know, exposed to Haitian history, to know uh, uh, our history through uh, historians uh, like uh, Thomas, Thomas Madiou, Senator Jean Baptiste, uh, etc., to uh, all the writers uh, of Haitian history before going to Haiti. Did I read them? Yes, I'm very well, exposed to the Haitian history. Well, my, my uh, dad had all these books. Um, one of the first books I read was Nightmare about the Age by Graham Greene uh, and talked about the Judai regime. But you know, I had history in my house. You know, I had. I had people like politicians come through my house, and I remember my, you know my father. Yes, I know your father. And, and he would sit us in the living room, let's say we had some like people I'd come to the house before he was president, and he, he allowed me to kind of eavesdrop in the conversation. Um, when I, first time I went to Haiti, I wanted to go with purity. I wanted to, not to be my dad's experience, that there was a backdrop, a beautiful backdrop it is, I wanted to see it with my own eyes, and I was working. You know how it is when you go to Haiti. You're working, and I remember, like you said, I, the, the plane landed. I get off the plane, and the minute my right foot touched the floor, it was like an electricity went through me. And my my initial reaction was to drop to my knees, but I didn't. I didn't. I had to control it really, really hard. And I remember I stiffened my knees up and I went like this. I went, Ugh! and I just and I took a step. And then all of a sudden I got it. I found history converging on my presence so fast. It was like watching that part of your film when you just drop in all those pictures down. My memory, my, my collective consciousness came to one place and one point. And I was so humbled. Um, I am proud to be Haitian. I'm sure. I am proud of it. I, yeah, I, to, I travel all around the world. You know, people ask me, what are you? Because they can't figure me out. I said, I'm Haitian. They said, oh, you, you, uh, you from Africa? I said, no, I'm Haitian. Oh, you from Sudan? Yeah, I'm from Sudan. <laughs> so. Yeah, um, my, uh, my evaluation is that uh, most Haitians are not aware of uh, our origin. Because when Haiti uh, was, uh, we declared our independence, the majority of the population was from Africa. Right. Born in Africa, brought as slaves. The emperor was assassinated on the Pont Rouge, uh, 17th of October, 1806, after yeah. two years of uh, uh, reign in Haiti. Why? Because uh, the other generals, uh, the mulattoes, didn't want to share the, the wealth of Haiti. Yeah, we so, have a few minutes, on the side. I don't so, uh, the, my, my question is that <laughs> learning about history, our beginnings, is very important. Yeah, sure. And, uh, you know, those books are available at uh, the Schomburg Library of Black Culture in New York, in Harlem. And uh, we should go and uh, learn more so we can understand why we have so much, so many divisions in Haiti right now. You see the classes, etc. But uh, that's part of our history. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know I'm just a kid, but I was there during the beginning of the political stuff of this year. And it kind of scared me. But you're trying to send this to Haiti. What do you think you're mainly going to accomplish by sending this over there? Wow. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, my biggest dream is to have something like this, maybe like half, or maybe this, this size here. And there'll be Haitians from the diaspora, the, the ones who say they want to come with me, they come with me. Kids like you, kids maybe who aren't Asian, come with me. And then people in Haiti that live there from all different sectors. And we have a forum like this. And then people like you, this, you know, went to Haiti and said, you know, Haiti was a little scary for me. And then, 
somebody else that lives in Haiti that may be your age would maybe address that. And then someone else would say, well, you know, why do you drive a Ferrari through people who are like sitting in mud? You know, and then the guy with the Ferrari will say, well, you know, blah, 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 blah. that's my dream. And then I want to go all around the country in Haiti. And then, and then I want to start a new film because I got to gotta keep making films like we write books, you know. We have amazing Haitian authors, but we need filmmakers. We need filmmakers. Yeah. Okay. A question here? Hi, Rachel. Thank you so much. I was so happy to see uh, a place I wanted to go, uh, what's the name of the, that place, the Cascade of Water? Solo. Yeah, I've never been to Solo, but I would love to go, but tonight I had a chance to see it. Thank you. And I'm, I'm a Haitian storyteller. Yes, and, and my <laughs> my question, I'm Lydian Nerefus. My question is that, in your work, in what you, the film you're projecting for next time, would you touch the Haitian folk tales, the bookie and malice, the click crack? Are you planning on doing that? Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Good idea. Good. Good. Good for you. Drop the mic. Yeah. You know, I, I, my answer are you going to do it? Why don't you do it and I'll help promote? I'll put on the TV. You still tell me I will do it. Right. We have a kind of collaboration. Look, we're going to have to talk to you. One more question. Okay, this is the last one, okay? The last, the very, very last one. Okay. It's more of a statement. There were four questions asked. And all four questions need a great answer. And that last one is telling exactly what I wanted to say. It gives you a reason to do a part two. <laughs> so you know. Um, look, we're gonna we have to leave now. If you want to continue this conversation, if you want to meet me personally, <laughs> everyone here is welcome to the Little Haiti Cultural Center or Complex. It's going to be an after party. And please, this is how we support films like this, and we're so happy for your support now, but we need more support, because there's so many other stories that need to be told. And thank you, Pam. Thank you, thank you, yeah. thank you, yeah. my foundation. And but most of all, thank you. Because it was a beautiful day today. You could have been anywhere else in Miami. And you chose to be in this beautiful, beautiful venue. Thanks again. And I hope I see you at the Christian Culture Conference. Can I just say something? I also want to say, Marie, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Marie. I've, I've both heard so much for the past two weeks. And Mari and the entire um, Pam team, Denise, thank you so much. And uh, please join us at the Little Haiti Cultural Center. Keep your buttons because that's how you get in. I think it's $10 and they have Chef Irie that's going to be mm, doing music. Chef Irie, what? Music? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that should be really nice. And it's my, I got the trains to my studio. Oh. And we can maybe go to Carl's studio for the after after party. All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks again.